thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation uh, to uh, give you a talk on um, an important topic, the uh, uh, rethinking of the rodent carcinogenicity testing of human pharmaceuticals. You see here a picture that we have taken from the uh, ICH group in Athens in uh, last May, when we finished nearly the, uh, the, the document. Now I have to, um, yeah. The, in fact, the background, I will give you a, a talk about the background of this uh, document and put it in perspective to the other ICHs as one guidelines as well. In the um, uh, history of the uh, carcinogenicity studies, it became clear that 50% of all pharmaceuticals used for long-term therapies induced uh, cancer. And, and there are several publications mentioned here, all in the um, framework, the two from 1997 in the framework of the ICH-S1B. Uh, in the data from uh, our group van Oosterhout, that was the paper from, from Europe. Um, it was clear that the, the mechanistic background in the uh, carcinogenic studies was that there from the 181 compounds in the first overview, six uh, were uh, have a genotoxic character, four an estrogenic character, and two were immunosuppressants. Um, so, if these are the, the most important uh, mechanisms, human relevant mechanisms, uh, so why should we conduct so many studies? And that's a question that has keep me busy for um, uh, all those years. I was happy that at a certain point in time, Frank Sister, on behalf of the uh, American uh, Pharmaceutical Asso Industry Association, came with this uh, statement that the red chronic toxicology studies are good predictors of the negative outcome <clears throat> in a two-year red carcinogenicity study in, uh, with 182 compounds uh, with some additional compounds. It was clear that the, the predictivity of an organ by organ basis is poor, but the overall negative predictivity is very good on a whole animal basis. So if there is no chronic preneoplasia in a six month study, no genotox and no hormonal perturbation in those studies, then there is no value from a, a two year red carco study. It is all in, it is really predicted. And that uh, the results of these analysis are the start for the um, uh, new document on the uh, S1B. So this is the hypothesis that a red chronic tox study will identify an effect that would define the, the need for completing a two-year assay. Is there is, if there is positive histopathology in any tissue, uh, if it is genotox positive or clear evidence of hormonal perturbation, just learn uh, run a two-year essay to to see the uh, to see the outcome. Now, I have to say that the genotox positivity is not a, a, a good addition because uh, genotox positive clearly genotox positive uh, compounds. Uh, are not required to have a study. That was already an S1A, but that's uh, a, a small detail. But if the histopathology in all tissues, and there is no genotox and no evidence of hormonal perturbation, then there is no need to perform a study. And, and in that way, that type of hypothesis was in fact the start of the negotiations. However, um, there were also uh, false negatives. So um, in this, the, the study publication from Sister, uh, there was an identification of 21 to 24 false negatives. What is the impact of these false negatives? It's 15% uh, uh, 
maybe uh, somewhat somewhat around that, 10 to 50 percent. And that's why in the EU we started uh, to an, uh, make an analysis of the pharmacology and to look at this um, data set with a more integrated approach, not only histopathology, not only genotox, but also pharmacology. And we have found out that the false negatives are exceptions, exceptions in their class. And, and so because based on that pharmacology, there is not a real concern or a well-known risk. So the false negatives could be included uh, in the full in the uh, analysis of the study. Um, they do not change the, the, the predictivity if we take on board the pharmacology. And that's in, published in this study. Uh, the authors in this study are the, uh, at that time, the participants in the um, uh, carcinogenicity assessment uh, group in the, from the uh, EMA. And uh, there we have published an, uh, uh, the, the pharmacological analysis of the data set uh, from, um, uh, uh, from pharma. You see on the, on the, uh, in, in the, uh, on the right um, the, the 191 derived from, the, from pharma, uh, a bit more because they neglected the few. And then there were some studies added from, uh, from FDA, as well as from the GPMA. And in total, we had around 300 uh, compounds. And we analyzed them with the, uh, the pharmacotherapeutic uh, categories. Uh, and you see the, the high number of the different categories. And that lead to um, the uh, outcome that you see specific classes, uh, classes with a high percentage of red carcinogens, which is on the left. Um, most of those compounds in the, that specific pharmacological class are positive. Whereas there are also uh, an, an even higher number of negative classes. Uh, mo most, although the, the classes were a bit small, uh, you can, we have taken these as, as classes because they were consistently negative, uh, except for the anti-inflammatory compounds, but that's only one out of 12. So from that point of view, we could indicate, yes, there is a, a, a clear relationship with the pharmacology and the, um, uh, and, and uh, in some cases, a positive carcinogenicity. Here we see the, the inclusive uh, classes um, and also from that data set, uh, in, in some cases there were data from other uh, literature or from uh, earlier cases that you can say, okay, uh, for the dopamine agonist line two, we have only two in, in this data set but there's more in the, um, uh, in the literature and we know that the dopamine agonists are clearly related to some uh, tumor types, which is uh, different from the, uh, for, for instance, the opioid agonists. Uh, <clears throat> two are positive, two are negative, uh, but the two, the two positive are more related to liver enzyme induction uh, and not related to its uh, pharmacology. So from that point of view, these data confirm the hypothesis about the role of pharmacology in the, the carcinogenicity assessment. Can, can we say more about that? Yes, we can. Here you see the, um, uh, uh, a picture from uh, Hanegan and Weinberg. Uh, about the hallmarks of cancer. What are the most important elements leading to non, uh, cancer? And uh, you see here uh, uh, around 
a, a, a different, a different uh, um, mode of action. And in effect, you see the, the, these are the physiological statements um, related to growth factors, uh, kinase inhibitors. Um, and, and you see that, that those uh, effects all contributing to the, um, uh, the induction of, uh, of cancer. And, and you see here an, um, aspects that are important. The, the limitless replicative potential which can be stimulated by some, uh, uh, some pharmacological actions. Um, it can induce the, the insensitivity to anti-growth signals or just stimulate uh, the, the self-sufficiency in growth signals. And those factors are indeed important in, um, in the, the pharmacological background of these uh, uh, compounds. So we raised a new hypothesis that when the outcome is predictable, studies are not needed. That's the, the, the fundamental um, uh, hypothesis. Um, based on positive prediction, on the basis of pharmacology, positive classes support positive prediction. Furthermore, uh, the, the, the presence of proliferative signals in histopathology, uh, for instance, hypertrophy and hyperplasia can discuss whether hyperplasia is more predictive than hypertrophy, but that's not, uh, apparently that's not the case. Also hypertrophy has a potential predictive uh, property. On the other hand, the negative prediction, which is confirming the Sister hypothesis, is based on the absence of histopathology in, in line with the Hister, Sister paper but also with a negative pharmacological class. And, and uh, that's an important element to be added. What we did in the ICH was starting a prospective evaluation period based on, uh, and we defined, in the next slide, I will define a bit more on that, uh, on the reason. We have defined three categories. The category one is a, uh, a category for compounds likely to be tumorogenic, uh, based on, on mechanisms, based on pharmacology, the product will be labeled as such, and lifetime rat or mouse studies or alternative transgenic mouse carcinogenic studies would not add value. In fact, this, this category one is related to the ICH S6, the, the the hypothesis about the growth factors in the biotechnology area. Then I go to category 3A. Um, 3A is likely to be tumorogenic in rats, but not in humans. To prior uh, established and well-recognized mechanisms known to be human relevant. And we then we can mention the mechanisms that we have seen in the paper uh, as, as discussed a few minutes ago. Um, category 3b is likely not to be tumorogenic. This is the negative class in both rats or humans, and then a no to no two-year rat study is needed. That leaves open the studies where this is not applicable, and that's category two. The available sets of pharmacology and toxicology data indicate that the tumorogenic potential is uncertain and rodent uh, studies are likely to add value to human risk assessment. So it's in fact the, the, the rest category and, and not the full, um, uh, and, and just we have insufficient data at that moment to be, sh to be certain about the, the carcinogenic risk. In fact, what we did in the prospective evaluation, evaluation period was that we have a tryout with products in the real world. Uh, you are aware that the, the, the data set that we had was around 300 compounds. And it's not realistic to have a prospective study with so many, uh, so many compounds. So the, 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 the predictive, the, the, the 
um, prospective evaluation period is not meant to uh, statistically to support the approach, but more how to, uh, uh, what type of elements do we see in, real, in the real world scenario uh, and that can help us to, um, uh, uh, to write a guideline that is um, useful in this respect. Within the ICH uh, group, uh, we have uh, uh, regulators and the, the five regulators that have mutual confidentiality agreements uh, were working to together in the ev evaluation of the carcinogenicity assessment documents that the sponsors uh, were asked to submit with a prediction to which class a compound would belong. Uh, so uh, at the outcome stage of the study, the hypothesis of the prediction will be checked and the added value, value has been evaluated. So the carcinogenicity assessment document prepared by the sponsors uh, are the, 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 the most important element. Can you predict to which category it belongs? And if it pre uh, belongs to category three, uh, can you really say that the study has no added value? And from that point of view, we have done this um, analysis. And the, this analysis will be published now in a scientific paper and we are working on that. So the carcinogenic, the carcinogenic potential assessment can be completed for a substantial number of human pharmaceuticals without conducting a two-year rat study. That is, in fact, the hypothesis. And the pharmacological and toxicological data from studies present at the end of phase two and, and other sources in literature can be integrated to predict the outcome of a carcinogenicity study. And that's, in fact, the hypothesis. And the target in 2013 was that we had, would have 50 um, carcinogenicity assessment documents with a substantial fraction of uh, category 3A, B cases. How to write uh, such a document? Uh, this, the document should address the overall carcinogenic risk of the investigation on drug as predicted by weight of evidence elements. And those are listed here. Um, the knowledge of the intended drug target and pathway pharmacology, the secondary pharmacology, and also the drug target distribution in, in rats and humans. And in fact, that's the, uh, the uh, relate to the pharmacology, of course. Then the three criteria that are derived from CISTER, the histopath, the gene tox, and the hormonal perturbation. But also we should know whether a compound is immunosuppressive whether there are other mechanistic studies and endpoints. Uh, are there uh, data from the non-rodents? In fact, uh, in, at the end of phase two, also the, the uh, chronic study from the non-rodents should be known and can be incorporated to, to, uh, in the assessment to evaluate or to um, explain some findings in the rodent study and sometimes there might have even already been uh, a transgenic mouse study. In May 22, you have seen the, the, the picture from Athens. Uh, the, the product is uh, finished completely uh, with a total count for the number of CADs of 48. And we have reached that 48 in December 2017 with a total category, uh, category three number of 32 based on the sponsor proposal and 24 on the, um, uh, the DOA evaluation. And at the end, we have received uh, 45 summary reports from the uh, carcinogenicity studies three were uh, reports have not been uh, uh, finished. I'm not sure why, but at least the study was not finished in time 
or has uh, has been stopped uh, prematurely. Uh, but that was not uh, further explained by the uh, sponsors. This is the outcome in the categories and the concordance. Uh, you see here, uh, uh, again, the number of uh, the CADs and the, the number of the, um, uh, uh, and the, and the categories. The sponsor uh, has mentioned three categories. One, uh, I will I think I will come to that later, but then uh, the sponsor has also proposed 11 for category 2, 31 for categories 3A and B, uh, but that uh, um, we have lost that one because that was not uh, the, the um, uh, one of these three that is not finished. So but the DRAs decided only 24 in category 3AB and the others should be in category 2. And you see the 7 moved up to another category with a total of 45. What is the concordance with, among the DRAs and on the sponsors? DRAs are not always unanimous. And for the 3A cases, with 7 decisions were unanimous. Uh, five were only split. We have five authorities uh, and they had split opinions uh, even within a group in the uh, authority. Uh, then also such an opinion can be uh, a split opinion uh, reflecting the, the scientific value of the discussions. Uh, that means that in these uh, Category 3A, we have 12 compounds uh, with uh, uh, a few of the uh, DRA um, uh, agreeing to um, 3A, and we have 12 in the 3B, making it 24. So, in, in fact, this indicates that the um, outcome is really balanced. If we give a look at the analysis of the summary reports, um, that the outcome of most, not all, the two-year RAF studies were consistent with the weight of evidence evaluation provided in the associated uh, carcinogenicity assessment documents. Some cases were, um, uh, the outcome was different. It can be explained, but it, it means that, that uh, a positive prediction is uh, a bit more difficult than a negative prediction. Uh, for cases where inconsistencies with the RAT study outcome were observed, the, the EWG conducted a retrospective analysis to identify information in the pharmacology and toxicology data to refine the weight of evidence criteria that should be addressed in the, in the uh, the future CAD. So um, we have evaluated all the all that stuff. We have included that in the document, and that will be explained also in the paper that I announced. There are differences in data interpretation between DRAs and and um, and the sponsors, um, and yeah, that might lead to that. Uh, differences in categorization, which were in, indeed observed during the, the study. That, it, that's all in the game. These are the, the way of evidence attributes. Um, the target biology is well characterized and not associated with cellular pathways known to be involved with human cancer development. This is uh, these are the, 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 the weight of evidence attributes uh, to support the conclusion that a two-year red study would not add value. So this is in fact uh, the weight of evidence attributes that leading to a category 3A uh, or 3B. Target biology is well characterized and not associated with human cancer development. Often the pharmaceutical target was non-mammalian, for instance, antiviral drugs, 
and the carcinogenicity data were available within the pharmacological drug class. That that's, um, uh, is very helpful. The results from the chronic tox study indicate no hyperplastic, hypertrophic, or atypical cellular alterations, uh, leading to some duct. Uh, if that is all not, not the case, then um, you can say, okay, the histopath is negative. There's no perturbation of endocrine and reproductive organs observed. In many cases, we have also the data from the um, um, reproductive uh, studies, reproductive toxicity studies, uh, and that, is very, that was very helpful. There were no identified concerns from secondary pharmacological screens, no evidence of immune modulation or immunotoxicity, and the overall assessment of the gene tox potential is concluded to be negative based on criteria from the S2. So this is a, a, a clear description of um, a, a, a typical three, uh, category three case. Our conclusion of the prospective evaluation period was that the results of the, this study can support a weight of evidence-based assessment for small molecule uh, pharmaceuticals that have attributes similar to those observed in the unanimous category three cases as just explained. However, for a significant number of programs, the two-year red bioassay continued to provide value and remain the appropriate path. You can have a question, what is the number and what is the significant number? Uh, and we can discuss at the end. The key principles in the addendum are that these changes to the S1 uh, introduce a more comprehensive and integrated approach to address the risk of human carcinogenicity of small molecule pharmaceuticals. Under this revised approach, the need for two-year rat studies are not always warranted. The need for a study can be evaluated on a case-by-case basis to determine whether the carcinogenicity studies can be accepted uh, just as an assessment in lieu of conducting a two-year red study. You see, and that's important to, um, important to know in the background, that we try to avoid the word waiver. This is not a request for a waiver. It is, there, we can not give a waiver for a carcinogenicity assessment. This is just another, um, another approach to do a carcinogenicity assessment without a two-year study. And uh, I think that's an important element to uh, keep in mind. Clarification is needed um, or is provided on the criteria for deciding whether the, the conduct of a two-year red study of a given pharmaceutical would add value to this risk assessment. These are the weight of evidence factors. Those are listed in the... Um, so the weight of evidence factors are listed in the, the document. Target biology, secondary pharmacology, the chronic tox studies, perturbation of the endocrine and reproductive organs observed, the genotoxic potential and the immune modulation. Keep these six factors in mind, and this is the um, the, 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 the flowchart that you say, okay, the sponsor assess the key biological, uh, pharmacological and toxicological information, as just explained in the uh, factors to consider, gather data for the factors to consider, conduct an integrated analysis of the weight of evidence factors, as explained in the just, and that will lead to a choice that the carcinogenic potential is uh, in humans is likely. Um, in fact, we have not mentioned it as a category. We have now for the real world deleted the categories. But you see 
the, the elements uh, back in this uh, scheme, the carcinogenic potential is likely, and then uh, it is sufficient to document the weight of evidence assessment and seek regulatory consultation for not conducting a two-year study. Uh, the second possibility is the carcinogenic potential is unlikely. In fact, this is uh, the, 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 in the study, this was the category three. Uh, the doc to it's uh, the purpose to that the sponsor will document the weight of evidence assessment and seek regulatory consultation of not conducting a two year head study, but they have to conduct a mouse car, car study. And the, uh, and the third possibility is that the carcinogenic potential is uncertain. Then uh, the S1B section four is still applicable um, and the company is requested to do a long-term car study. And at that, in that case, it is not needed to consult the regulatory uh, authorities. It's up to the uh, sponsor, of course. So, scope of these uh, uh, S1B are one uh, guideline at the end of addendum is now that all <clears throat> that the scope means that is applicable to all small molecule pharmaceuticals where carcinogenicity evaluations are recommended as described in ICH S1A and the, the, the objective is that uh, the testing scheme is expanded. Uh, you have the possibility to do carcinogenicity studies, two-year CARC studies, but there's also the possibility to introduce, to, uh, uh, to apply an integrative approach uh, based on the weight of evidence criteria. And, and uh, that's the uh, additional approach uh, we have also added a plasma exposure ratio based approach for setting the high dose in the RAS H2 transgenic alternative mouse model. The, the implication and the benefits of this approach is that it encourages a more scientifically based approach to carcinogenicity risk assessment of small molecules starting earlier in development which will reduce the number of two-year red car studies with associated savings in animal use, cost, and timelines. And of course, uh, that's also, those are the managerial aspects that are important. Also, the, the 3R aspects that is important. This is the table of contents of the, um, of the addendum, the S1B R1. Um, and I will handle, uh, discuss a few aspects in that. There are uh, cross-references to other relevant guidelines. The first one is that this addendum should be used in close conjunction with the S1A on the need for CARC studies. And it, it's uh, clear from its intention that is if the S1A guideline indicates you need a study, that this approach is a possibility to conduct uh, the carcinogenicity uh, assessment. Of course, also the S1B, it's an addition to the S1B, and it is related to the S1C dose selection for CARC studies. The addendum includes also uh, references to the uh, gene tox testing. Um, if the gene tox is fully negative, then th that doesn't, um, uh, that does contribute to the weight of evidence. Uh, if it is equivocal, then a study might be helpful. And also there is another study, the ICH or the other guideline, there's the ICH S8 on immunotoxicity um, and, and that's also a problem uh, that the immunotoxicity testing is an important aspect and an important risk factor. Um, human relevant 
carcinogenicity, but rats are difficult to, um, is a difficult species. So not all human relevant um, carcinogenic compounds with immunotoxicity are positive in the rat study. So immunotoxicity as such is, is a risk factor for carcinogenicity even without conducting a two-year rat study. Then the, the last one, I mentioned it already, that the IGHS-6 already includes a type of carcinogenicity assessment approach for growth factors and, and, and uh, other related uh, biotechnology derived pharmaceuticals. Uh, that uh, a carcinogenicity two-year study is not always possible with uh, biotech-derived products uh, and thus based on the aspect that no model is available, the, uh, uh, this, this approach is already uh, applicable. So the summary of the guideline indicates that um, uh, the integrative weight of evidence assessment approach as described in the sections 2.1 and 2.2 in the document may support the conclusion that the test compound is either likely to be carcinogenic in humans, um, the product will be labeled accordingly and the two-year rat study would not add value, for instance, with a strong evidence of immunotoxicity. The second, likely not to be carcinogenic in humans, such as that a two-year rat study would not have value. It may also be not carcinogenic in rats, or even if it is carcinogenic in rats, but through well-recognized mechanisms known to be human relevant. And the last possibility is that it is uncertain. And in that case, a two-year rat study is likely to add value to human risk assessment. In the um, section 2.1, the, the weight of evidence approach is um, uh, indicated more explicitly. Uh, a comprehensive assessment of the totality of data relevant to carcinogenic potential available from public sources as well as from conventional drug development studies. And then you see the six, uh, uh, the, the six weight of evidence factors. First, the uh, drug target biology, the primary pharmacological mechanisms, second, uh, second, the secondary pharmacology, third, the histopathology, uh, and of course the exposure margin assessment is, in, is also applicable. Evidence of hormonal perturbation, there, there is a large overlap, but with the secondary pharmacology. The genetic toxicology, in relation to IGHS2, and then six, the evidence of immune modulation in accordance with IGHS8. And then you come to the second figure in the uh, document where the um, uh, weight of evidence factors are explained in the same way. The target biology is, if it is uh, poorly characterized in the uh, it's more likely that we have, that there is a need for uh, a study. And in the, on the right side, it's explained as a study is not, uh, uh, not really needed. We have to be careful. Um, so this is just a repetition of what I have said already several times. If you see here, genotoxicity, uh, a study is more likely if uh, positive genotoxicity data gives an, uh, are of uncertain human relevance. And in that case of uncertain human relevance, it might be helpful to do a study. The study might have added value. But if there is no genotoxicity risk, risk then a study is not needed or that doesn't add value in the argumentation. But even if there is unequivocal genotoxicity, uh, as, as 1A explains, then also a study uh, is not needed because then 
there is a risk already identified. And the same is true for the, um, uh, for the Im immunotoxicity. If the immune effects are un of uncertain human relevance, then a study might have added value. But if there is broad immunosuppression already characterized in humans, then a study doesn't add value. Uh, so the, the, those, those aspects are important. When one or more weight of evidence factors may be inconclusive or indicate a concern, then the sponsor can conduct additional investigations that inform the human relevance. And we should keep in mind that additional investigations is not always a two-year study. It might be special studies, analysis of specimens collected for prior studies, or even clinical data generated specifically to inform human mechanistic relevance and therapeutic exposures. So it's, if there is uncertainty, it is not always the answer to conduct a two-year study. We should always think, and that's an important approach in that, that I have always defended. The summary of the guideline content um, indicates uh, in the section two uh, that by all factors contribute to the integrated analysis, the relative importance of each factor will vary on the specific molecule. Uh, it's uh, the drug class. If there is um, in, in many cases, a compound will be from an, will have a novel drug target. Then there, yeah, you can say it's a first in class. Uh, and those are, um, you can apply a, an integrated weight of evidence based approach, but you can imagine that a higher evidentiary standard is expected to establish that there is no cause for concern. We have had several discussion, several cases uh, in, in our data sets, uh, and we will explain that in the paper, but it's uh, their regulatory authorities have more uh, tendency to, um, uh, to emphasize that if, a, if there is a novel drug target, you should always do a study. And I think that that the um, that it also in this case additional studies, uh, for instance uh, genomics, uh, might be important in the future. Uh, so that that's the uh, that the background. In the document itself, there are a, a, a four case study examples. Uh, pro uh, demonstrating how the weight of evidence factors can be integrated in determining the need for a two-year rest study. And, and please go through those case study examples to, to apply and to learn from how the weight of evidence approach is used in, in practice. And then a short remark on the, um, uh, the plasma exposure in the res 2 model. There was a feeling that the res 2 model was not involved, not included in the S1C, in the dose selection uh, on based on exposure. Uh, the, uh, there has been a study conducted by the Japanese pharmaceutical industry. And based on that study, we have defined that there is no value in exceeding a 50 volt plasma AUC exposure ratio from uh, the ratio to a rodent and human exposure to support carcinogenicity assessment. So uh, the, the, the top dose can be defined as 50 fold um, in the, um, compared to the human exposure, just as the 25 fold uh, is applicable for the, for the red study in, um, uh, in for the two-year wild-type rodents. And this is the paper published by the um, Japanese Pharmaceutical Manufacturers uh, Association uh, together with Frank Sister. So what are the final considerations? 
the, when the sponsor's weight of evidence assessment concludes that the conduct of the two year red study is not warranted, the sponsor should seek alignment with the drug regulatory agency in each ratio and where marketing approval is sought. When the sponsor decides that a study, that they will do a study, then there is no obligation to seek uh, concurrence uh, or to document their rationale with each DOA. It is preferred, but it's up to the company. The CARC study in mice remains a recommended component, except in unusual circumstances. Uh, that, that was a huge discussion, and this is a copy of the, the statement in the document on 2.3. A carcinogenic study in mice, either a two-year or a short-term study, as defined in the S1B, is remains a recommended component uh, of a carcinogenicity assessment plan. Even if the weight of evidence for rats indicate that a two-year rat study would not contribute significant value. So um, we hope that the, uh, the dose limit of 50 volt human AUC, that will lead to a reduction also of the use of the two years studies in, uh, in mice. There are cases where it is not appropriate to conduct a mouse study. For instance, if uh, the, the the, the, the conclusion is that it, it's that a rat study is not needed because we already know the mouse study may not appropriate when the weight of evidence evaluation strongly indicates no carcinogenic risk to humans and the data indicate that only subtherapeutic and pharmacological inactive drug levels can be achieved in the mouse so the, the, then the mouse is not an appropriate model and on the other hand, if it is likely to be carcinogenic in humans, belonging to what we said, category one, then the conduct of a mouse study may not be appropriate. If we have a relation with S1A, we have touched that uh, several times already. Um, it's mainly because of the cause of concern. So these are the seven factors that, that are important in the relation with the uh, uh, to define the need for a study if there is a cause for concern the human relevant mechanism with products from the same class we have that uh, it, it is important if it is a human relevant mechanism yeah that's changed now in this document it was one of the uh, recommended purposes that you should do a study that's not longer needed if there is evidence of neoplastic effects in common tox studies in rodents is mentioned in the S1A, yeah, that's still applicable, uh, unless um, we know the background of that. And also the, the long-term retention of metabolites is included in the S1A, and that's still a uh, concern uh, leading to an added value of a, of a study. But you see here also categories of the number three, the genotoxicity. If there is clear genotoxicity that there is no need to conduct studies, it's only needed if the outcome is equivocal uh, or equivocal and uh, a need to administer uh, such compounds chronically. But that's usually not the case. With respect to the ICHS S1C, uh, it's mainly on the dose selection criteria, and that's applicable now too um, for the, uh, the, the transgenic mice. Uh, the maximum tolerable dose is the classic design, how to define the top dose. The 25 multiple of human AUC is applicable for whatever study, uh, and for the transgenic mouse, we have now the 50 uh, the, the 50 times multiple, but also saturated absorption and pharmacodynamic endpoint are important uh, elements. So there is a conclusion that the uh, S1B R1 
the addendum introduces a more scientifically based and integrated approach to assess the human carcinogenic risk for small molecule pharmaceuticals using weight of evidence criteria evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis in the area of always conducting a two-year rat study. And a plasma exposure AUC ratio of 50 fold is an acceptable criteria for high dose selection for carcinogenic studies in RSH2 transgenic mice. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your attention.